for coming all the way from Atlanta to uh, give us our After which there's books for sale and here's the dedicated. Um, here are some sheets. Um, last name of the group. Um, meanwhile, uh, thank you so much. I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, also, I'm truly honored that that a rabbi of the state of New Jersey, where I lived for five years and where my children were born, my five older children were born. This here, um, it's, it's really an honor. Um, <coughs> um, Nina. This, uh, uh, my book is also dedicated to my parents. I hope Shona doesn't mind. Um, that, um, uh, I'm originally from the former Soviet Union. And uh, when my parents were growing up and when I was growing up, it was forbidden to learn Torah. It was forbidden to speak Hebrew. It was forbidden to celebrate holidays or to have any outward sign of Jewishness at all. And um, my parents had never seen a uh, Tanakh. When we got out in 1979, uh, Hayas arranged for us to leave Russia and to make our way uh, through the West. Our first stop was in Vienna. So in Vienna, they arranged for us to have a place to stay, shared apartments with other families, other refugee families, and, and a little stipend for food. And they also gave us a Bible in Russian. Now, um, it was the first time we'd ever seen one. So my mother had this habit that when she would open a book, for the first time, she'd open it somewhere to the middle, read a little bit. If she liked it, she'd go back to the beginning. Um, she wasn't worried about spoilers, um, and so she opened uh, she opened this this book to the you know somewhere random, and she read the following, and she read the following, <clears throat> and I'm just going to read it in, in English. Um, I will say to the north, give over, and to the south, do not restrain. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Wow. She looked at wow. them. She said, "Well." That happened. <laughs> um, well, at least it happened in part. In part, you know, the North did give over, uh, and ultimately, ultimately, um, my sister and I made Aliyah. My parents also made Aliyah, and they they spent their retirement years in Israel, watching their grandchildren speak Hebrew and celebrate all the holidays and learn lots and lots of Tanakh. And um, this book is based on a shear that I gave in their house. Uh, for several years. Um, the, uh, what I learned from my parents is that the Tanakh is not talking to other people. It's talking to us. And frankly, there is nothing like uh, that demonstrates that quite as much as the Aftorah that we're going to be talking about, which is the uh, Aftorah of Kukat, not this week, next week, but close enough <coughs> from Shoftim. Now, in general, the Aftorah is a real problem. Okay, people come to shul, and I've heard this from many, many people, different walks of life, very, very from people, and conservative people who come to shul now and then and don't really expect to understand. But they all say, Haftar is the time where I really, really feel lost. And some people say, oh, Haftar is the time I schmooze with my friends, or Haftar is the time I go out and get a drink of something or another. <laughs> the Kiddush Club. <laughs> um, I've had people say that to me. Um, Catch up in the well, that's for us women. Um, catch up in the davening. Um, the reason for that is threefold. Reason number one, um, the Torah is often poetic, and the language of Nevi'im Achrom in, in particular is not easy to understand. Um, so, for that reason, I translated it myself, and I translated it in a poetic form so that I think you can even see here these are, these are mostly screenshots. Um, or you can see from the book, um, that if you, if you display something as poetry, it makes it a lot easier to relate to as poetry. And the translation is my own, because the Nevi'im did not intend to be archaic. They did not intend for you to read it and say, uh, behold, beyond, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. That's not how they presented themselves, and that's not how I want to present them. 
Um, and then there are words and phrases that ring a certain um, ring, ring certain bells with us that they might not have rung in other generations, which we'll see here, I think. That's, that's the first thing that's hard. It's just hard. The second thing that's hard is like, unlike the Parsha, the Parsha goes in order. You go from Rishi to Noah, you learn about Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, you more or less follow your way along. The Aftora is a wild roller coaster ride. Yes? It has the first parak in all of Navi, is the Aftora of, um, uh, of Zot Abraka, the first parak of Yoshua. The last parak in Malachi is the Aftora Shabbat Agadol. And everything in between, seemingly at random, and that time period spans uh, spans eight hundred something years of Jewish history. And you never know where you're going to find yourself, right? Um, let's see, where are we now? It's uh, we did Shlach last week. That's that's Yoshua. This week we're in Shmuel Korach. Next week we're in Shoftim. That that's still good. That's the name of And the week after that you were in Micha. That's at the end of uh, who knows. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> right? So, and and to make, and it's not even that it tells you the whole story from beginning to end. Often, it starts in the middle of a story, right? Back in Machar uh, Chodesh, David, you know, Yonatan says to David, "Tomorrow is my day as Rosh Chodesh." Who, what, when, where, why? And also, it doesn't always end at the end of the story. They say goodbye, but what happens to them after? And the same thing is true for the Nevot as well. The, the Nevot. Uh, of Nevi uh, Mechronim, uh, it doesn't always start at the beginning, beginning, middle, and no, it can start like Ronia um, Kara, for instance, very famous, the author of, uh, of Hanukkah and Zalotcha, in the middle of a nevuah, like actually the tail end, and it's two or three more nevuot. And sometimes it's not even that it doesn't end, it like has to skip two, three chapters to give you like two verses just so you don't end on something horrible. Now, how are we supposed to follow that? You have to be, you have to really, really know Tanakh in order to understand where you are and what's going on, just to even start. Um, so to help that along for each, for each uh, Haftorah, um, I give a little historical introduction of where you are, what's been going on, who's talking to whom, and why. You know, sometimes it really takes a while, like in Nachar Chodesh. Um, and then, it, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, in order to help follow what's going on, to follow like the flow of the story, I break it up into pieces, as I saw fit, with little introductions. So before you read it, you know more or less what, what's going to be happening, so that you could tell if it's going to be good news or bad news. Because even if I translate it, it's not always clear. Anyway, so that's two. And then, of course, there's the big question of... Why, of all the chapters and all of Nevi'ah, why was this one chosen to be uh, the Haftorah for that Parsha? What is it that Chazal saw? Now, Haftorahs go way back. Uh, um, a bunch of them are listed in, in the Mishnah. It says, oh, and this day, and on Shabbat, Haram, Haftirim, Bicheskel. Right? It goes way, way back. <laughs> the choice was made by Chazal. It's, it's a form of, of commentary. But what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to understand it? So every so often you'll find, like in the art school, will say, oh, um, not to say anything bad about art school, but, but you know, a word or two, they'll say, Chayesar, uh, no, not Chayesar, what do you call it? Bayera, it said, uh, that was about Achnas Sorchim, this is about Achnas Sorchim, enough. But there's always more. <laughs> uh, usually what I ended up uh, finding is a metrish, because that comes from Chazal, and the metrish is from Chazal, and often the metrish will bring a pasuk from the Parsha and a pasuk from the Haftorah and put them together in order to present their message. Now, a lot of times when people see a metrash, they'll see what the what Chazal want to say, blah, 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 and then they bring proof text and everybody ignores the proof text. Apparently that's not what you're supposed to do because the proof, you go and the proof text in the context and you put the two texts together, you'll see what Chazal actually means to say. And that we're really going to see in, in this week's, uh, in, in the Haftorah that I'm presenting. Um, so with that introduction, so there's a map, just to let you know, but we're going to reference it, okay? It's a very, very, um, yeah. Um, okay, so where are we? 
<clears throat> this is uh, Yiftach. So um, um, what I brought you here is a, is a screenshot. Uh, the clarity is because it's a screenshot, the actual book is printed very nicely. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry. Um, okay, so, um, so Yiftach is one of the last of the judges. So it's been about 350 years since um, since the Yitzhak Sitiat Mitzrayim, since they've entered the land. And as uh, Shona pointed out, a lot of things have happened. Some positive, some a lot less positive. And here we're going to see, we're going to see a snapshot of something that is both positive and less positive. Okay, so this is how they introduce Yifka. And I'm going to read everything in English. Yifdach the Giladi was a warrior. He was the son of a harlot, actually prostitute. Um, Gilad had born Yifdach. Okay, so this is this is a good place to start, right? This is going to be our next Shofet. His name's Yifdach, he's a warrior. His, uh, his father was presumably a, a wealthy person. His mother was a prostitute. Okay, Gilad's wife bore him sons. The sons of the wife grew up and chased away Yifdach. They said, you will not inherit from our father's estate. Because you are the son of another woman. Okay, so yeah, I, this is not a story that you wouldn't want him going to your kid's cheder, right? Um, so he ran away. Yiftach ran away from his brothers. He settled in the land of Po. Yiftach attracted empty men who ranged with him. They were rangers. In other words, raiders. In other words, highway robbers. So that's the state of Am Yisrael. Now, sometime later, Nei Amon fought with Yisrael. Okay, now for the map. Um, um, just a little bit. Now, the Gilad, which is where Yifkaf lives, is more or less where, um, you see the Kinara? Where it normally is? So on the other side, on the other side of the Kinaret, that's Gilad. Yeah, where Menashe is. Menashe, more like God. Like that whole area is called the Gilad. Okay, it's every area. Doesn't say on the map. Doesn't say on the map. Okay. So like the, the hills. The hills up there. Yeah. The Jordan River the okay. There. Right. And now you see Amon is on the on the side there. Okay. So they're neighbors. Okay. So. Um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the J Jordan still has its capital Amman. That's Rabat Neamon. Goes back. Um, okay. So Neamon fought with Israel. It makes sense. They were neighbors. They're not the most friendly of neighbors. Always on and off. They were fighting. It's been a good couple. Uh, it's been let's say the last time they fought was maybe with um, Yidon. So it's been a it's been a while. But now there's war again. Um, okay, so when Naaman fought with Yisrael, the elders of Gilad went to get Yiftach from the land of Tov. And they said to Yiftach, go be our commander and we will fight Naaman. And Yiftach said to the elders of Gilad, uh-huh, aren't you the ones who hated me and chased me out of my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? He said that they, uh... He was like the local mafia, mafia. Yeah, he's the local Robin Hood, let's say. Let's give him credit. Okay. Um, Robin Hood. Let's say. We don't know. We don't know he's giving to the point. Let's say he's giving to the point. But that's what he's talking about. You know, so this is a guy. His mother was a, was a prostitute. They threw him out of the house because they don't want him inheriting with them. They threw him out of the family. He goes off. He makes it. You know, he's famous. He's successful. He's wealthy. Doing whatever it is that he does. He's. Um, but he is very good at the fighting. So, uh, and when push comes to shuffle, they come crawling to him. So now they got to convince him. So the elders of Gilad said to Yifta, that is why we have returned to you now. So you should go with us. And you would fight Naamon and be our chieftain of all the residents of Gilad. We're going to make you in charge. And Yiftach said to the elders of Gilad, uh-huh, uh-huh, if you will bring me back to fight Naamon and Hashem will give them up before me, I will be your chieftain, right? 
You're not gonna, because what's what's he afraid of? They, you know, he makes uh, everything better. He fights for them, and the next day they say bye bye, right? They must have been Jewish. They're all Jewish. <laughs> um, so, um, so the elders Gilad said to Yitzchak, "Let Hashem arbitrate between us if we do not do as you say," uh, which means they're going to swear. Uh, so Yitzchak went with the elders of Gilad. The people placed him over them as a chieftain and a commander, right? Um, Yiftach said all his words be- before Hashem and Yitzvah. He, you know, stated his case. Everybody heard him. They all swore he's ready to fight. Okay. So here we are. We're ready to fight. But, so the next thing we would expect to see is you know, like, uh, let's say when uh, Barak uh, and Barak, Barak finally convinced Barak to go start a war. So he went and he gathered up people to start fighting. When Shaul, you're going to see next, and we keep going with Sefer Shmuel, when Shaul had to fight uh, with various people, he he was able to gather people around and start fighting. So you'd expect next verse would be, and Yiftach went and gathered people and they started fighting. That's not what you see. This is what happens next. Uh, verse uh, 12. Yiftach sent messengers to the king of Namon saying, what is there between us that you have come to me to fight against my land? He sends messengers, opens diplomatic channels, saying, what's going on? Why have you attacked us? The king of Naamon said to Yiftach's messengers, for Israel took my land as they went up from Egypt, from Arnon to the Yabok to the Jordan, now return them for peace. Hmm. I am not making this up. <laughs> okay. Now, what is his claim? Going back to the map a little bit. The, okay, it's a little bit hard to see. But the Arnon to the Yabok is, um, is this middle section here. Okay? And that, uh, where it says Ruben. Um, and that, right? So, so, so Am Yisrael ca- captured that part. We're going to see how, because Yifab is going to tell the whole story, which is the story of Rashad Um, uh, So, um, right, so Amon says, this whole land that you say is yours, it's actually ours. It used to be ours, it's ours, give it back. For peace. Really, not making this up. Hey, look at that. It says, uh, you look at uh, what it says in the um, verse 13 okay so now Yiftach still does not start a war if we start a dip- diplomatic process they've got a narrative we also have a narrative let's hear our narrative so Yiftach once again sent messengers uh, verse 14 to the king of Naamon he said to him so says Yiftach Yisrael did not take the land of Moab nor the land of Naamon Amon and Moab are cousins and neighbors. Rather, when they were going up from Egypt, Israel went through the desert to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. They went around this whole area. Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom did not listen. And also to the king of Moab, he said, but he did not agree. Israel stayed in Kadesh. We asked permission to pass. When, and when people said no, we abided by their decision. So he, that is Ab Yisrael, walked in the desert. He detoured around the land of Edom and the land of Moab. He came from the east toward the land of Moab. He camped on the bank of the Arnon and did not go into the territory of Moab, as Arnon was the border of Moab. Yisrael sent messengers to Sichon, king of the Amori, king of Cheshbon. Now, the Amori is neither Ammon nor Moab. In a, as, as, the, as the Torah tells us, in a previous generation, the Amori had come and conquered that part of the land. It had belonged to Moab, but the Amori came and they conquered it for them, and they were in control of it now. And that was who Israel fought. They didn't fight Amon and they didn't fight Amon. Okay? So, um, and even Sihon, Israel said to him, let us pass through your land to my destination. But Sihon did not trust Israel to cross his territory. Sihon gathered his whole nation. They camped at Gaz and fought with Israel. And Hashem, the God of Israel, gave over Sihon and his whole nation to Israel. They defeated them. 
Israel occupied the entire land of the Amori, who were living in that land. They occupied the entire territory of the Amori, from the Arnon to the Yabok, from the desert up to the Jordan. Now, Hashem, the God of Israel, displaced the Amori in favor of his nation, Israel. And you would push them out? Oh, actually, one second. Let me, before we get to the God part. So, um, first of all, the historical, uh, the historical point that he makes is that, I can't see, is that that territory, right? As Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael were circling around from the bottom around this way, okay? Because, you know, they had to come in over here. Yericho's like over here. So they had to go like this. And they asked Edom, hey, can we pass by? And they said no. So they walk all the way around. And they said, Moab, Amon, can we, can we, can we pass through? Just that away. They said no. That's why uh, the Moabim, aren't, we're not supposed to marry them, right? That's how much it was. They could have been nice and they weren't. Anyway, so they went all the way around over here. And over here, there were the Amori. And Amori is fair game. Amon, Edom, God says in the Parsha, God says, they're your brother. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to press them, not allowed to fight them. Little known fact that Ed, um, Esav and Edom, for as much as we say uh, Esav, son of Yaakov, According to the Torah, we're brothers, and we can remain brothers, and we have expectations of them to be acting as brothers and like that. Um, in any case, Amon and Moab are Lot's children. They are cousins. And God said explicitly, this land I have given to them. It's not for you. You're not allowed to conquer. You're not allowed to touch it. Walk around. So they walk around, right? 40 years in the desert. You right? have time. And then, um, but the Amori, which is none of them, right? Amori is uh, Canaanites. Fair game. So they fought, and even then they gave him a fair chance, but uh, they didn't listen, and Moshe fought right before his death, fought Sichon and Og, conquered this whole entire land, and it is now theirs, and it never belonged to Amon or Moab. Okay, so that's the historical lesson right there, according to Yiftah and the Moshe. Yes? Hashem told them they can't have Amon and Moab. To walk through, just to walk through. They said, "Please let us walk through. We're going on the road. We're not gonna. We're not gonna uh, destroy the crops. We're not gonna. We're not gonna do anything. Just let us." There's something called Der Hamelech that you could go see now. If you ever go to Petra, very cool place, Petra. Go to Petra. They actually take you on something called Der Hamelech. It goes goes back to them. Okay, so that is um, that is the first argument that he makes. It is the historical argument. I actually find it very interesting to see that Yifta, who is not what we would call Yeshiva Bakar, right, actually has a very, very good uh, sense, grasp of Jewish history from several hundred years ago, which I think it tells us something. Um, okay, then he makes the next argument. Uh, this is verse 23 in the middle of the page. Uh, now, Hashem, the God of Israel, displaced Amori in favor of his nation Israel, and you would push them out? Isn't it the case that whatever Kemosh nor God gives you, that's what you will occupy? And whatever Hashem our God gives us, that is what we will occupy. That's what you call the religious argument. We have a God, you have a God. Your God gave you your land, our God gave us our land, and we should, you know, obey our gods. A very important argument also for us. Um, and next argument. And now, are you better than Balak ben Sipor, king of Moab? We're going to meet Balak a couple of weeks from now in the Parsha. At the time, he was the king. He was a very famous, well-known king. I think he's even documented in external sources. Um, so did he fight with Israel? Did he make war with them? Right? If Balak had thought that they had done something wrong, then he would have uh, fought this war. And now you come and you say, well, you know, who are you relative to your very famous ancestor, Balak? If he didn't fight, why should you? And the next argument, while Yisrael has been living in Cheshbon and its suburbs, and in our or in its suburbs, and in all the cities by Anor for 300 years, why haven't you tried to liberate it during that time? We've heard that. We've heard all this. Tell me. You had your chance, and then you did not think it was worth liberating back then. What happened now, 300 years later? So 
So any, uh, continues, I have not done anything bad to you, but you are doing evil to me by making war with me. What you are doing is not just. It is not according to the laws of, you know, of international law and behavior. I haven't hurt you. You're coming to hurt me. That is unjust. And let us show judge today between Bnei Israel and Bnei Amon. Uh, that is one of the one of the longer speeches in Tanakh, and one of the best. Uh, I think really, really well laid out and very well framed, like a whole essay. Book. Um, did it work? No, of course not. Um, but he did not listen. <laughs> then King of Mammon to the words of Yisda that he had said to him. So what's next? Next is war. So the spirit of Hashem came over Yiftach. Now, for the record, the spirit of Hashem in Tanakh, you've, you've seen it, right? You saw the spirit of Hashem come with Shimshon. It doesn't mean Ruach HaKodesh that, you know, you have, uh, all of a sudden you know things that are going to go The spirit of Hashem means the drive, the drive to do something, even though it doesn't necessarily make all that much sense, and it's not something you'd be able to do as an individual. All of a sudden you have that more than charisma, it's, it's, it's a drive. Ruach Hashem is the same. You know, it, it takes you and it sweeps you along, and then you do it. I mean, a lot, a lot of power. And we see it with Shimshon, we see it here, we see it in other places in Tanakh. Um, and I think we see the history, if you look at various places in history, there's no other way of, ex- of explaining why certain individuals were able to do the things that they did, unless you say that they had Ruach Hashem. Um, in any case, so the spirit of Hashem came over Yiftach, he crossed the Gilad and Minashe, he crossed Mitzvah Gilad, and from Mitzvah Gilad he crossed to Bnei Amon. Right, he's got, uh, he goes there. Meanwhile, he made a vow to Hashem. He said, if you will indeed give over Bnei Amon to me, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house towards me, when I come home safely from Bnei Amon, will be for Hashem, and I will offer it up as an offering. <laughs> that, hmm? What was he thinking? Don't know. Um, that is that that is not a little, I mean the the second half of that story is not in that story, unfortunately. Um okay, but we have that foreshadowing. Meanwhile, Yiftah crossed to Neamon to make war with him, Hashem gave them over to him, he wins. He defeated them from our or to the area of Minis, twenty cities up to Abel Kramim, a tremendous blow. Neamon were subjugated before Israel, And that's what I thought. So, so the parsha promised to make that connection. First of all, very, very, uh, uh, a very, very clear connection in the in the sense that the history that he references, that story is in fact found in the parsha. So you don't have to look very far. Um, it is an interesting thing, by the way, if you think about parsha Chuka. And who can start so the, uh, the para, duma, and all the holiness there? The after is not for there. The after is for the middle section of the war. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, our one year cycle was developed in Babel, and before that, there used to be a three year cycle. It just would take longer. And they would re- read a third of our Pasha each time. Um, and those sections had Haftoras also. And there have been people who have managed to reconstruct what those Torahs were, plus or minus, um, based on various clues in Midrashim, based on the various things in the Gniza. And uh, there are a few cases that the Torah that we read isn't for the beginning of the Parsha, it's for the middle of the Parsha that they would read them. This is one example. Another example is Lech Lecha, where of all the things that happen in Parsha Lech Lecha, we read uh, the Aftor that matches the, uh, the war um, with the five kings and the four kings. Uh, that was the Aftor for that section, and that, that is what we read. In any case, so that's the very obvious thing. But that's not good enough for us. Um, so there's one more thing. When Moshe Rabbeinu uh, was leading Bnei Israel, in that circle, you know, past, as we said, um, you know, from the south, and he had to go east and then into Eretz Israel. God gave him certain instructions. And in source uh, number two, we have the instructions they gave. Go travel across the river Arnon. 
See, I have given over to you Sichon, king of Kashbon, and Mari, and his land. Begin occupying and start a war with him. Today I will begin putting the fear and awe of you upon all the nations into the sky. They will hear your tale and will be frightened and fail before you. Okay? Now, this outlines God's plan for, um, for how Bnei Israel are going to conquer Eretz Israel. As you know, um, Eretz, Eretz Israel, Eretz Canaan was inhabited. It was not empty. And the people who were living there, as the Meraglim said last week, were in fact powerful, uh, with um, wealthy, they had armies, they had, uh, they had uh, walls, they had structures. Not so trivial. And part of God's plan was that, Mo, uh, that Am Yisrael and Yisrael, on their way into Eretz Yisrael, would first defeat a very famous and powerful enemy. And then, once, once they have that on their resume, when they enter Eretz Yisrael, everybody's going to say, wait a second, this isn't just some bunch of nomads. These are people who defeated this very, very large and powerful Sichon and Og. And so God says, okay, I'm, you know, you're going to ask to pass. They're going to tell you no. It is very, very important that you fight this war because when you win this war, it will cause, um, it will cause the appropriate atmosphere for you to be able to succeed and enter into Eretz Yisrael and fight those wars. So you would think that knowing that God Told, tells him that you're going to fight this war, then Moshe Rabbeinu would show up and start saying, hey, we're going to fight a war with you or just attack or whatever it is. But that is not what he does. And source three is only here what he actually does. By Yishlach Yisrael Malachim, Yisrael sent messengers to Sichon, king of Amori, saying, let us pass through your land. We will not trespass in fields or vineyards. We will not drink well water. We will walk on the highway until we cross your territory. Now, Moshe Rabbein knows that the answer is going to be no. Not only that, he knows that the answer has to be no, and that he has to fight him. He knows this. That's the plan. Then why does he bother sending these messengers? The lesson, then, the lesson, the, what, what is the lesson? Maybe he knows that he saw them. Don't know. So all of these things. But let's see what the Medrash what the mentor says. Okay, that's source number four. And watch what the Medrash says. Gadola Shalom, greatest peace, that even in a time of war we need peace. As it says, this is a Pasuk and Dvar, not related to, it's not our Parsha, but it's okay. When you approach a city to wage war upon it, you should first call to her in peace. Okay. But then it also says, I sent messengers from the eastern desert. That is a pasuk in Devarim that references this. Yisrael Malachim. Yisrael sent messengers. And what's the third pasuk? Shoftim, return them for peace. Here, if you don't know the whole context, if you don't open up these sukim and you say, oh, what is he talking about? You would never figure it out. But we just read them, so we're good. Um, the return them for peace is a reference to the Torah. It's a reference to where it says, you know, when, when instead of straight going out and fighting, Yiftach starts the diplomatic process. Ve'yishlach Yiftach Malachim. And, and Moshe Rabbeinu, right? He says, ah, I send messengers in the parsha. Ve'yishlach Yisrael Malachim. Greatest peace that even at a time of war we need peace. It's hard for us to understand a little bit, or maybe not. Maybe maybe exactly the period of time that we're living in, which I, I feel I often identify with Sefer Shaktim. I don't know if you guys did when you were learning it, but there are all these the struggles and the democratic process because Shoftim was a dem democratic time, for better or for worse, um, and um, and the kinds of enemies and the getting people together, you know, to be on the same page. And the religious problems and the social problems. Um, so we identify with them a lot. But um, and we also identify with people coming to us and saying, you know, 
give us this land for peace. You're not from around here. You conquered it. You took it. It's ours. Give it back. Um, it seems, though, it seems, though, that diplomacy, and that is what they're talking about, the diplomatic process, Veishlach Yisrael Malachim, is a value that is not just utilitarian. It's not just a question, oh, is it going to work good? If not, that doesn't, you know, then, it, then it's pointless. It's not that Moshe Rabbeinu knows that it's not going to work. Yiftach probably also has a pretty good idea that it's not going to work. We all know reading it that it's not going to work. However, however, Gadol Shalom, the value of it is, is imminent. It is, it is a value in and of itself. The ability to say, okay, let us ask. Let us state our uh, position. Let us state our narrative. Let us listen to what you have to say. Let us try to be on the same page. Let us offer a compromise that makes sense to us. Apparently, according to Chazal and according to the Torah, it is a value in and of itself. Gadol shalom. And of course, in both cases, when it doesn't work, then we fight, and then we fight to win. That's what we have. It wasn't the negotiation. It was just asking to go through. Originally, yeah, yeah, you say, is asking to go through, is asking for something eminently reasonable. Right? And he didn't go he didn't go to it saying, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go to it saying, okay, well, you're in our way, we're going to fight you. Goodbye. You know? He said, here's a chance for you to be civilized. Isn't asking to stay in their houses? No, not staying in their houses. And if you go, if you go look at the Chumash, then when you listen to Pasha, look, listen carefully to what they to what they do and do not ask. They don't. They say we're not going to touch anything that doesn't belong to you know that you're not giving us freely. We're not drinking from your wells. We're not touching your. You're not messing with your life. Stop grazing fields. Nothing. Um, that you know when God wants them to say no, they say no. So there's also that aspect of it, right? I mean, we know we know that God is running the he's, that He has a plan and He's running the show, but it's nevertheless our part. Still, our part is to anyway offer the civilized solution, the diplomatic solution. That's what it is. Because your presentation was cut out. <laughs> I would venture to suggest to you what the next time you use the sheet super bright pen. Oh. Rambam is talking to you how to fix that. That would be the cherry on top of the cake. Excellent. Thank you. Why do you say it's democratic? Each, yeah, each man, yeah, and what do we call that? Uh, <laughs> each, yeah, each, uh, it says each, yeah, yes, everybody. It's not only that, I think um, I often uh, joke that the Jewish nation are inherently ungovernable. Okay? Um, no, we have no government. <laughs> It, 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 never mind, I mean, you know, you're going to get to Shmuel, right? You're going to get to Shmuel that you had a king for 40 years, right? And David Amalek has one setback, you know, with Shalom, whatever. He goes back to, become, to recover his kingship. What do the people say? They say, ah, eh, we don't need this. Yishu Alecha Yisrael. We don't need a central government. We're fine by ourselves. They didn't learn their lesson. No, and did, did we? Um... And if you look at Jewish history, there are all kinds of little arrangements that people have throughout the history. You know, this council and that council and this, you know, and, and uh, communities, Rov Binyan or Rov Minyan, is it going to be governed by the pure majority or do people who contribute more have a greater voice? Complicated question. And, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it says about um, Am Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu is, you know, Rashi says this in Dvarim, um, and that, you know, he'd leave his house er, you know, late, they'd say, oh, he's sleeping in. He'd leave his house early, they'd say, what, he had a fight with his wife? <laughs> Some people call that not so much democracy, it's anarchy. Yeah, <laughs> so our default is anarchy, democracy is a step forward, 
And, uh, you know, Yiftach um, Begaro, Kishmu El even the ability to gather any kind of leadership, to gather any kind of army is not to be taken for granted. The fact that we're here, that we're able to organize ourselves to this extent is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Yeah. We could, could we look back at Yaakov as having been the original uh, initiator of the diplomatic system <laughs> before Vaishlak Israel Malachim? For sure, Vaishlak Yaakov Malachim. So, and so in right, this case, it did pretty much. Right, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, a discussion on that and exactly which the process they used, and there's also criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, but simultaneously yeah. prepared for war as well. Right, all right. So no, some people said they groveled a little bit too much. You didn't have to go that far. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. But the Madrash doesn't bring that. They bring, they bring this, which was, which was interesting. It's like a, a different thing. Perhaps maybe now, as an individual who's vulnerable, has to protect his family, maybe that's one story. But this is a nation. In both cases, we're talking about a nation. And you know, that does have an army and is powerful and is going to win, and they nevertheless take these steps. Um, any other questions? Also questions about the book and in general. Um, it's available for sale, signed copies, and uh, it's 100 shekel each, so I don't have to get change, and I take yeah. D-Box and other things as well. Thank you so, so much. for. <laughs>